My first experience with ivermectin was uh, treating pretty large scabies outbreak uh, about a year and a half ago in one of the nursing homes that I attend to. It went smoothly, we had no side effects. Because I, I do a lot of nursing home work, I was pretty nervous trying to figure out how am I gonna treat my patients when and if we get COVID. During this time, I was doing a lot of reading. Um, there was a lot of stuff about hydroxychloroquine paired with the zithromycin. And then I got wind of, it was an in vitro study um, out of Monash University in, uh, in Australia. And uh, a tissue culture was infected with the uh, COVID virus. And um, after treating it with ivermectin, the virus was essentially gone within about 48 hours. one nursing home. I used the same ivermectin dose that we had used treating scabies. And in addition to that, we had um, vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc. And this particular nursing home was really people kind of at the end of life. But then the, um, the next facility was a, an assisted living. But as soon as we got word that uh, a patient had COVID, I started the, the uh, vitamin C, the vitamin D, and zinc on uh, the entire patient population. Um, then uh, within a couple days, we were able to get some testing done. We ended up with a total of about 34 positive patients. None of these patients died. I used the same dose of ivermectin. No one there, like in the first facility, developed severe acute, uh, acute hypoxic respiratory failure. The fact that we, we didn't lose anybody uh, out of the 34 positives, I thought was, uh, was uh, fantastic. The third facility, they were almost at capacity and they uh, really got slammed. And I think they're uh, in a short period of time ended up with about 110 positive cases. One other physician started using the ivermectin and then for various reasons he decided, well, maybe this really isn't standard of care. When the dust settled, I had lost two patients and he had lost 17. Almost all the focus, you know, at least here in the United States has been treating the really sick people, the people that go into the hospital. How do we keep people from getting to that point in the first place? I thought that ivermectin was a, a reasonable choice. There just really didn't seem to be um, a lot being done um, that would allow these COVID patients to get picked up early, treated with something. I did write a letter to uh, some of the doctors at the NIH and just described my experience with the different facilities and the outcomes. I was basically pleading with them to, to get something initiated. Ivermectin has been used uh, in a number of studies uh, in the hospitalized patients and it found that uh, the patients get better quicker, they get out of the hospital sooner. The stories are all out there. I would encourage physicians to look at the studies on ivermectin. I think it's a, it's a drug that physicians and internists uh, know nothing about and they don't understand how safe it is. And I would also encourage physicians to start educating themselves on what's going on with uh, ivermectin around the world. You know, this is something that threatens every human being on the face of the earth. I'm just a firm believer in ivermectin. And the thing is that my experience isn't just in one facility with just a certain group of nurses. It was seven different facilities, seven different environments, seven different groups of staff and pretty much the, the same results all the way around. Welcome, welcome to the FLCCC Alliance Weekly Update. I'm Betsy Ashton, the Creative Director of the Alliance. I had the good fortune to interview the wonderful Dr. Chesler and all of the other people, Lou Gossett and the others in those videos. And we are delighted to give you the opportunity to hear their stories. Um, 
We are here tonight. This is a live webinar. We are here Wednesday evening, seven o'clock Eastern, four o'clock Pacific and everything else in between. And we are here to tell you what's happening uh, in COVID treatment that our doctors consider important. And what we have is about 30 to 45 minutes. We will give you information and take your questions. We have an important disclaimer I have to say, please remember that anything that we tell you tonight is not medical advice. We are not your doctor. We don't know what's going on inside your body, but what you get here is information that you can share with your doctor and say, hey, is this something that is good for me? Because we know it's good for a lot of people and that's why we're telling you about it. What you can expect is the short welcome from me that you already got about seven minutes of the latest updates of effective treatments and things that we know about, something special is coming tonight, and about 10 minutes of our Dr. Corey, who is the critical care physician. He's the president of the Alliance. He's an expert. Uh, he, is, he has authored so many medical studies that are published in fine journals. He's a textbook author of one of the ones that's used all over the world. And tonight he's going to explain something interesting that happened this past weekend. It's a conference that was held in the UK called the Bird Conference. He'll have to explain what that is, but he'll also tell you why it's so important for the global treatment of COVID-19. And then of course, we're gonna be taking your questions and first a bit of housekeeping about that. Uh, it's a live webinar. Use the Q&A function that you see down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will take your questions from there. Now, there's also a chat function. We know you want to get on that and you can chat with all your friends on that, that's fine. But we'll pay attention to the Q&A. That's where we will take the questions. And if you want to get answered, put it in there and we'll take as many as we possibly can. Now, briefly for that update. This week, we're gonna focus on news coverage because a lot of you have been asking us uh, in the United States, why is it that we're not hearing about ivermectin and the FLCC Alliance and what you're doing on our major network or local news station um, and on, you know, in our newspaper? And all I can tell you is you'll have to ask the editors and the news directors why they're not covering us. But we will tell you, and this is what I want you to know, we are talking to the world. Here's, an, here's a sample. Japan, uh, one of Japan's national TV networks, uh, BSTBS, based in Tokyo, said, we are preparing to broadcast a program about ivermectin on Thursday, February 25th. We would like to know if it's possible for Dr. Pierre Corey to talk about the FLCCC and the effectiveness of ivermectin via a video call. And of course, the answer was yes. And he had a very good long talk with the Japanese. Ireland, Health Freedom Ireland presented an interview on a program that they produce called The Healthy Debate with Dr. Corey and several other physicians from around the world, from India, Ireland, and the United States. The host introduced the program saying that they will present all viewpoints on the topic that they discuss to allow viewers to make up their own minds about their own health care uh, decisions. And this show's title was, Is Ivermectin a Good Alternative to the COVID Vaccine? Puerto Rico, this is really interesting. We received a request from the Fondación Saludable Puerto Rico, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to create awareness about the importance of maintaining a lifestyle conducive to good health and quality of life. They said, we have studied the research conducted by your organization regarding the use of ivermectin as part of a protocol for the prevention and treatment of COVID-19. And we are preparing to conduct an awareness campaign in Puerto Rico regarding the use of ivermectin in the prevention and treatment of this disease in order to raise the use of ivermectin on the island. And of course, we participated in that. Norway, 
Let's go back to Norway. We get a letter. My name is Anne Rosted Stockholm, a reporter at TV2 News, Norway's largest commercial broadcaster. She says, I'm writing to you because I've been contacted by Norwegian doctors and health workers who've advised me to do a story on ivermectin and the work that your organization and Dr. Pierre Corey are doing on this. I viewed the Senate hearing where Dr. Corey participated and your findings are very interesting. And of course, Dr. Corey participated in Norway. Uh, and then the last one we'll save for now is Belgium. This uh, organization is called Vital Transformations, the Impact of Technology Made Simple. The managing director, Dwayne Schultes wrote from Belgium, I was recently made aware of both the FLCCC consortium's presentation on the outcomes surrounding the use of ivermectin and your congressional testimony. I'd be very grateful if you'd be willing and interested to participate in our podcast series. And he says, it'd be my pleasure to have a further discussion with you regarding your protocols, both prophylactic and preventive, as well as what has happened over the last month regarding your meta-analysis and the recent NIH decision to move ivermectin off the naughty list, which they did after we talked to them. Our podcast series, he said, has 1,500 downloads a month and generally has traction with key decision makers from government and industry. So that's what we're doing. We are talking to the world. We'd like to talk to a few more people in the United States. Uh, work on that. Talk to your news directors. But in the meantime, let's bring in our medical expert, Dr. Pierre Corey. Tell us, Dr. Corey, tell us what is the BIRD conference and why might that be a game changer in how doctors treat this pandemic? Uh, good question, Betsy. It's only the most historic conference in the history of the world, uh, maybe next to Versailles. Um, maybe I'm overstating it. Uh, I, I actually, I don't think so. Um, but let, let's talk about that for a second. So I always like to start with the FLCCC Alliance. Uh, is that what you're seeing, Betsy? Yeah, let's go. Okay. So um, there's Paul. Um, he's, uh, he's the brains on the beauty Right, and then we have Umberto. Absolutely. <laughs> no, but the, the, this is our crew. This is the guys who started it, and uh, all we are is just uh, doctors and scientists trying to do the right thing and trying to advocate for good expert medical care. And so, uh, I just always want to call attention to where it all started. Um, and so, I'm happy to be here tonight. And and you mentioned it, Betsy. So, the Bird Conference, and and let's be clear about what that was. So. It's a group in the United Kingdom, right? So it's the British Ivermectin Recommendation Development. And it started about six weeks ago where an expert consultancy started to reach out to folks around the world. And this consultancy actually, um, they've worked with lots of public and international healthcare agencies in formulating guidelines and assessing medical evidence in order to recommend treatments uh, for various diseases that plague the world. And so um, the group, they kind of coordinated uh, the same effort. And I have to say, what the, what, what the BIRD conference did this weekend, it mimicked the same process and procedures that the, you know, that the WHO does, that the, uh, uh, the NHS does any any major um, you know healthcare or, or public health body that comes up with rather profound and comprehensive recommendations uh, they go through a rather mature and sophisticated process and that's what they did this weekend and let's talk about what happened so number one uh, so the, the the what what the bird means it's the British Ivermectin recommendation development meeting and it, because it really originated in Britain. And what they did is they brought together about 75, a very diverse array, regionally diverse. So from many regions of the world, almost every continent, they brought together generalists. So just general practitioners who may or may not have known about ivermectin, patient rep representatives, obviously patients have as much skin in the game as anyone, as well as specialists. So researchers um, and, 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 and or specialists in the diseases that we talked about. And so they coordinated this effort 
there was no funding, there's no conflicts of interest. And what they did is they just followed the, the, the sort of time honored algorithm and protocol that you do when you sort of soberly and scientifically assess the level of evidence from the present uh, trials. And they did this with, I would say with a little bit of urgency and speed, uh, which I think should be supported and defended. I mean, we're, we're all battling a pandemic right now. And, and what they do is they, they did what's called a meta-analysis. And so anyone listening, if you're not a doctor, you may not know what that means, but meta-analysis, all that means is that you take, you try to combine all of the trials that have been done and you try to combine it into a similar uh, sort of outcomes that you're measuring. And you try to see what the sum of all of those trials show. And, and, and it actually takes experts to do it because it actually, it really requires a, a vast amount of statistical expertise. So they did this, what's called systematic review and meta-analysis, right? And so what they did then is they presented it. So this, the, the technical working group up here, um, they're the ones who did the systematic review meta-analysis. The steering group is the group that sort of uh, was the one who steered everyone, right? Who brought everyone together, got the technical working group to, pr to put together their data, to present to the recommendation development panel. panel and, 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 and a meeting was held this Saturday. What are we now? Betsy, what are we now? Wednesday? Five uh, days yeah, ago. Yeah, this is Wednesday. Wednesday, all right, so five days ago. <clears throat> And I really think this is a, a historic event because they, they went ahead and I think they tried to fill the void or at least the, the, the delay in someone else doing this. There's many uh, national and international agencies that are in this process and they just felt that the, the evidence was there and that, that someone should really try to make an assessment now. Um, if you're interested, if you look at this link right now, you can watch the entire proceedings. It's about two and a half hours, and you can see the presentation of the evidence, the discussions, as well as the votes on all the recommendations. And what they did is they assessed the evidence that was presented. So experts compiled, assessed the evidence, they presented it, and then uh, a large and diverse group of, uh, of folks uh, assessed it. And they did it on a few metrics. So desirable effects, undesirable effects, how certain is the evidence, what is the balance of the effects, values and preferences and resources and equity and acceptability and feasibility, which is all the things that you want to make sure if you're going to launch something on the world, you want to make sure that it's equitable, that it's feasible, that it can be launched and that can be have the most major impact, right? So, so a, a drug that costs a million dollars that's available to like 10 people, but it may save 10 lives. Yeah, that's great, but it's just not realistic, right? And so they, they make all these core assessments and with ivermectin, it was astonishing what they found. So first, I'm just gonna just really briefly just show you the evidence. I don't wanna go into the granularity because tonight is a Q and A, but this is just what's called forest plots. And if you look at here, this, this line here in the middle is one, which means that there's no benefit to the intervention. That between intervening and the placebo, there's no benefit. To the left is where is the extent of the benefit. And so if you look at mild to moderate disease, this was the extent of the benefit. This was the precision. So if it's wide, it shows it's imprecise, but it shows that there's a benefit. But if you look, everything aligns on the left side in the favor of ivermectin in the uh, outcome of deterioration. Same thing, recovery time to negative PCR. It, teams, it seems to eradicate the virus much quicker in mild to moderate or severe disease. It is statistically significant benefit. So again, favors ivermectin. Again, if I go back one, deterioration, recovery time to negative PCR, deaths, I would say all the other stuff is nonsense. We wanna know about deaths. Does it reduce deaths? Yes, it does to a very statistically significant pro proportion. If you take ivermectin, you will die at a far less risk or incidence than if you don't. And so it really showed a very profound effect. And again, I'm not gonna go over this document. The document is long, it's available. We're happy to distribute it. It's actually being distributed around the world right now. It's being distributed to many national and international healthcare agencies, including the WHO, the NIH, 
uh, the NHS, which is in the UK, the CADTH, which is in Canada, uh, the Japanese, and that's only the beginnings. And so uh, the group that coordinated this effort and, and put a lot of, uh, uh, of effort into this, they are actually distributing the recommendations. But I will just say this slide, after a culmination of assessment of the evidence based on all of those present, uh, scientists, researchers, general practitioners, and the public, not only did they recommend the, uh, the intervention, but if you actually look at the document, they very strongly recommended the intervention. So, so I have to say that, that the, the consensus or the, the collective wisdom of the crowd right now is that ivermectin should be used in the prophylaxis or actually prevention and treatment of COVID-19. Now, before I go into q and I'm trying to start this, uh, Betsy, I'm trying to start this like, you know, weekly humorous thing where I do palm to forehead slides, which is like, why can't people get it? So, so this week's palm to forehead slide, and this is what's so weird, is that I have been a subscriber to The New Yorker since I was 18 years old. 18 years old, and I'm 50 right now. I have paid my dues, and I've read them, and I've loved almost everything they've written. And, and even uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, who's actually a really uh, talented journalist, he published this article this week, which the title was, Why Does the Pandemic Seem to Be Hitting Some Countries Harder Than Others? It's a really unsatisfying article because it doesn't come to a conclusion. It entertains a lot of theories. And the one thing that bothered me about this article is it never entertained the theory that ivermectin could explain some of the variation in outcomes. And it's so clear, especially in Africa and in, in some of India, that ivermectin use really drives some of the differences. And so, so that was like, I actually got a little disturbed by the fact that it was a really long article by a very celebrated intelligent journalist and the word ivermectin never appeared. Okay. And the last thing I'm gonna leave you with before we go to Q and A is our analyst Juan Chimie, who does some of the most incredible work. Um, his work is most celebrated in that he identified that what happened in Peru, which is that these distributions of ivermectin led to these drastic decreases in deaths and case counts. You know what he came up with this week? And this is what's so crazy about it, is that if anyone who's listening, if you know what's happening in Peru, what happened is their political structure and leadership changed. And in December and towards the end of the year, the health ministers and the presidents that took over, they stopped all of the ivermectin distribution. And he's been able to track what has happened as a result. So if you look at these graphs, at the top are the deaths. So the deaths were very high. They were increasing. They were getting worse. Whoops, sorry. They were getting worse. Meanwhile, ivermectin distribution was going up and they decided to go all in. So in July, they gave tons of ivermectin. It was being distributed everywhere. There's being used widely in treatment. And after that, you'll see that the deaths decreased rapidly. And then everything was okay in Peru for a while, but then the deaths started to increase significantly. And if you notice, I'll go back to here, this is when the distribution stopped. There was no more distribution of ivermectin. And if you look up here, uh, sorry, I don't know why it keeps changing. If you look up here, the death started to increase. This is interesting. This is what's Google Commun Community Mobility, where they're looking at actually cell phone data. And this is less than baseline. So this is when people are in total lockdown. And as you see, over time, mobility increases amongst the population, and it's increasing a lot, but yet the deaths are very low, even though the mobility increases. But suddenly, if you look at ivermectin, boom, the deaths shoot up, but the mobility doesn't change that much. So it's, it's really another way of showing that it's really probably correlated with ivermectin. The other thing is, um, probably our latest country to convert or fall is Mexico, especially in Mexico City. The, the state hospital system, Mexico City, adopted ivermectin, and they started to distribute it for free. And that was in late December, early January. Very soon after the hospitalizations peaked, the deaths peaked. But look at this rapid and unbelievable decrement 
in the amount of hospitalizations and even deaths. And unfortunately, I ran out of time, but uh, Juan has even more updated data because now we're at the, towards the end of February and these lines actually continue. So it, it's just, you know, I could do this every week. I could do this all day long. Uh, well, you'll be back next you, week. <laughs> say again. We'll, we'll come back yeah. next week and I'll have even more. So right. with that, I'll stop. And this is just another one in Mexico City. Again, hospitalizations and deaths correlated with the adoption and distribution of ivermectin. All right, and then last I'll finish is, this is our map. Um, as you can see, most of it is gray, but there are pockets of like this, what color is that? That's blue green. There's pockets of blue green, again, most of Central America, increasing parts of uh, South America, India. In fact, there's Uttar Pradesh, the neighbor next door, which is Bihar also uses uh, ivermectin and that has like a hundred million people. If you look at Africa, the, it's starting to change. The one absence that I have to call out is Europe and North America. They're so smart. They know ivermectin doesn't work, Betsy, right? Yeah, right. Ivermectin doesn't work. You need monoclonal antibody. Never mind. I'll stop. Well, you need Let's to spend $10,000 or more <laughs> to try to get something. All That's right. what they want. Anyway, well, we, we right. won't go there. I, I probably went too long. Questions. We have yeah, questions. Yeah, let's go to questions. Let's All go to right. questions. Well, the first one, we have Kate Sochi asks, hello, hoping to gain some clarity on ivermectin use with long haulers. Can you help with the long haulers? Well, I would say, were you here last week? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and when I say that, um, we did a whole piece uh, last week on long haulers with ivermectin. And I have to say, we don't have definitive evidence. No one ever does. If you're going to wait for a double-blind, multi-center, randomized control trial with 10,000 patients, um, you'll you'll be really sick until that happens. In the meantime, we have a lot of encouraging evidence. We have not only some case series showing patients with weeks of symptoms who then get a few doses of ivermectin and feel a lot better. We also have a lot of anecdotes. And by the way, as a doctor, as a doctor who claims that anecdotes mean anything, uh, I'm, I'm in the ivory tower, I'm immediately dismissed. Anecdotes don't mean anything. You need a randomized control trial. Well, I got to tell you, I would invite anybody who dismisses what I say, Betsy, you've read these anecdotes. You've interviewed. I, oh, I interviewed patients. somebody terrific recently, yesterday. I mean, let me tell you, a 77-year-old woman for months, she was suffering the unbelievable pain, un I mean, chest pains and she diarrhea. I mean, it was just a brain fog, everything. She said she wanted to die and, and nobody would treat her with anything. And finally, finally, she had found a doctor who said, I think you ought to try ivermectin. This was in December. She came down with this in April. How many months is that? And she said, within 48 hours, it was just amazing. I got my life back. Everything just faded away. And she's now back to 100% back to herself. And this Bet is a woman who's 77. I'm Betsy, sorry, that's anecdotal, but it, I, I think it, it makes a difference. No, no. So, so you just, you've been a part of, because you've been interviewing some of the people who reach out to me. You've been immersed in some of their stories, which are so compelling, right? Yes. Scientists don't like stories. They don't like anecdotes. They like data. However, here's the here's the issue is that whoever asked that question, I would invite them to watch uh, our webinar last week in which I went through some of the data and some of the emerging evidence and some of the multiple case series and case reports of people who really have these prolonged symptoms and do better from ivermectin. Here's the thing that saddened me today is that someone alerted me to a website and the website is called C19, so C19, recoveryawareness.com. And it's apparently a website dedicated to the study and support of those with prolonged symptoms. And so I was really interested in learning as much as I could from that website. And when I went to that website, it listed dozens of studies all the studies were in describing the symptoms and the duration of the symptoms. I could find nothing on treatment, nothing on treatment. And I don't know of many trials that are testing different therapies, whether it's ivermectin or prednisone or colchicine or whatever you wanna do, we need more treatment trials. 
you know, I, I, I believe that the syndrome of long COVID has been inordinately and redundantly described in multiple medical journals. Where is the treatment? How do we help these patients? And I think that the FLCCC, that's one of our, um, I would say that's gonna be one of our goals that we're gonna champion going forward. So, so whoever wrote that question, uh, my early answer, <laughs> I don't wanna sound like Johnny OneNote, is try ivermectin. Uh, but, but my real answer is we really need to research treatment, uh, treatment protocols going forward. I have another question here that's uh, very interesting playing on the topic that you discussed earlier about the BIRD conference. Bonnie Sussman Versace asked, what is the possibility of the FLCCC becoming the national and international COVID advisor? Current advisors continue to fail us and the FLCCC doctors are the only ones that get it. How do you answer <laughs> that? Nice. <laughs> I, I am I am overflowing with love and mirth and, Thank and you, Bonnie. I, I, no I, I mean I get what that person's saying I, I don't want to sound like we're smarter than or better than everyone else but but what we try to be we try to be pragmatic and patient centered and we try to like uh, interpret the evidence and the data in a commonsensical way. And I think that's attractive to people. So whoever wrote that question said, hey, how come you guys aren't calling the shots? And I, I can't say why that is. The, the systems haven't been built in, in order to champion folks like us. I think we're a little bit too loose, <laughs> uh, but, but in this instance, I don't know. I, I think going forward, I hope we do have a voice and I do hope that our advocacy and our early identification our early accurate identification of efficacious therapies in COVID repeatedly beginning back in May with, with uh, uh, corticosteroids, continuing to now with ivermectin. I hope that it, history recognizes us and give us a, gives us a, some, some credibility and, and maybe a seat at the table. And, and hopefully we can be uh, part of a guide to good, good medicine. Um, the, the big joke, Betsy, is that I always say there's, you know, in Washington, there's the NIH, there's the CDC, well, CDC is in Atlanta, but NIH, CDC, and then there should be a building for the FLCCC. Yeah? <laughs> so Right. I like that. I like that. <laughs> We're going to move okay. down there, Betsy. <laughs> oh, we are. Okay. <laughs> I used to live there. I like Washington. Anyway, Maya Katsal writes... I am a primary school teacher in the UK. We have viewers in the UK, hello. I really do not want the vaccine. How can I take ivermectin as a preventive message? Do I have to purchase from abroad? What would I, what dose would I take? All right, so, so if you're going to prophylax, uh, whether you're uh, not a candidate for the vaccine or as in this patient, they don't want the vaccine, they're scared, um, we do have prophylaxis protocol. So I just invite you to go to uh, our website, which is flccc.net, and we have prophylaxis protocols for high-risk patients. Uh, and, and that's what I would advise them to do. As to how to get ivermectin, we, uh, if you go to our website under eye mask uh, plus protocol, we have a, a frequently asked questions um, page, FAQ, and we give some advice on how to get ivermectin. What I will say is going forward, the challenges you might have getting ivermectin prescribed now, I believe will change going forward. Um, just champion us in our work. We're trying to make this the standard of care. Uh, and I, I think it will be easier going forward. So, but at the same time, I, empath I empathize with your challenges. Yeah, Michelle Fisher, there are actually some two questions coming along this line. Michelle Fisher asks, how long can you take ivermectin for prophylaxis? I probably won't be eligible for a vaccine, she says. So I'd like to use ivermectin as long as needed. So the uh, most scientific answer is we don't know how long you can, meaning do we have like uh, data from thousands of patients who've taken it for years and determined to be safe? No, we don't have that. So I don't, I don't wanna yeah. pretend that we have all the answers. Uh, 
But what about the people that take it for parasitic infections? And they've been taking it to avoid elephants, uh, the it's, disease it's, and it's, all that stuff. That's a, fair, that's a fair point to bring up. The, the, the difference between parasitic prophylaxis and COVID is that COVID needs more frequency, right? So parasites, it's generally those programs are once every six months, once every four months. Whereas COVID, we're advocating once every two weeks. So what is the safety of of that kind of frequency. We believe that's one of the safest drugs to man, but not we believe, the data shows that it's one of the safest drugs known in history. So it's almost like you could take a Tylenol every two weeks, what's the harm of that? So if you think of it in that terms, or what's the harm of taking an aspirin every two weeks? There are people who take an aspirin a day for decades. Um, we believe it's safe. We don't have the data to show it's safe to take it over long periods but we have no data to show that it's harmful. And, and all we can say is that in prophylaxis studies, mostly in Argentina uh, run by the investigator, Hector Carvalho, who's an expert in ivermectin, he's now maybe in his 10th or 11th month prophylaxing healthcare workers every week with ivermectin, and he's not reported any adverse effects. And so that's the best answer I can give you is that all signs point to that it's safe for the long term. If that changes, you'll be the we'll be the first to tell you. Uh, uh, we promise. We we respond to the data. If we thought that it was harmful or we needed to change how we prophylax, we 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 would alert everyone. Uh, actually, Colin Glatz asked asked something very similar to that. Said, okay, um, you know, if you're taking the doses every other week, which is the prophylactic treatment that we recommend, um, what potential side effects should we be on the lookout for with regards to long-term repeated use? I don't know of any that you should think that would develop over long-term. Every side effect that's been ascribed to most medicines, and in particular ivermectin, has really been acute ones, meaning if you take it and, and it's mostly been described uh, in, rel in relation to parasitic infections, which is when you're battling a parasitic infection, you take ivermectin, you have the chance of getting fever, a rash, itchiness, um, you know, sometimes a headache or muscle aches. But if you don't get that within your first few doses, you really shouldn't get any effects. And if you do, let's say you're on prophylaxis, you're taking it for three or four weeks and something develops and you think it's related to ivermectin that goes away if you stop, let us know. I don't know. I've been taking ivermectin uh, every week to two weeks for, I don't know, maybe four to five months now. And I, I'm, I mean, it's like taking an aspirin. I, I don't notice anything, um, but we don't, we don't have any reports of side effects developing over chronic time. They, if anything, people complain about ivermectin in the short term, and it's the very few that do. Didn't those studies say that the, the side effects, that itchiness or whatever people had, generally was because the worm or whatever was that it was yeah. killing, was when it dies, the body goes through Absolutely. Side yeah. the worm. You don't have a worm. So no, okay. and that's why I said it, it's short term and acute. If you're going to have a problem with it, it'll be in the first few days or four days. But we, we know of no chronic symptoms that develop in relation to ivermectin. It's a fair question, right? If you take it for four months and suddenly some um, terrible side effect crops up, I don't want that to happen to anyone. I don't want it to happen to me but we have no knowledge of that happening over, over the long term. Elizabeth Bolter writes, is ivermectin passed through breast milk? And if so, how does it affect your baby? Does it sort of treat the baby also? <laughs> so we actually have uh, experience that we've been taught. So, so first of all, it's, it's, it's been um, assessed that yes, ivermectin is present in breast milk and it will pass to the baby. Is that a harm? It's not clear. Uh, one of our kind of alliance members, Dr. Alexis Lieberman, who's a pediatrician, um, she had an infant who was COVID positive and she gave Ten the months. mother ivermectin. And Ten she, months old. Yeah, she kind of treated the baby through the mother 
it, she kind of, my sense of her case that she described us is she did two things. She treated the mother prophylactically and she treated the baby therapeutically by giving the mother ivermectin and obviously it passed to the baby in breast milk. So all I can say is it does, it is present in breast milk at a proportion of the level it is in the mother. Um, and we know of no harm to that. Yeah, she, I did that interview with her and she said the baby was fine. Um, and it passed through again. Yeah. And in a lower dose, and, yeah, the baby it's, got it's, better, baby got better. Yep. Um, then Margaret Aranda, Dr. Margaret Aranda, who is an MD and a PhD, said, please comment on the latest California mutations now thought to cause vaccinations, vaccinations less effective. Another reason to keep ivermectin on board, even if vaccinated? Yeah, so, so you could substitute that question. You could say, what about South Africa and Brazil and the UK? I mean, it's not just California, right? Everybody has the question. Do new mutations uh, mitigate or lessen the efficacy of vaccines? And will ivermectin still be effective? Again, I want to be humble. We don't have definitive evidence However, I am aware of no evidence that ivermectin is not effective against new strains, number one. Number two, on a rational scientific basis, the mechanisms of action in which ivermectin exerts its antiviral properties are numerous. So I don't think, and, and I would say my group, and uh, of course, Dr. Marek, my mentor, my friend, our leader, um, we've discussed this numerous times, we don't think that a single mutation would, would, would avert the efficacy of ivermectin. We think it's going to hold its efficacy through multiple strains. And, and if it doesn't, oh boy, are we in trouble. Um, but we don't think that's going to happen. The last question you're going to love. This is from Karen Levins. And I'm sorry, folks, that- Wait, I know Karen Levins. Oh, you do? I, I oh. email with her. She's lovely. <laughs> she's she's very thoughtful. She's a, a wait, hold on. She's no gonna good. listen. She's a retired toxicologist, and she she's oh. very very thoughtful and very very uh, uh, expert. So well, uh, you're tell gonna me like what, what she says. But we have to apologize to everybody else because we got a lot of questions and there's, we just can't get through them. You have to watch us next week. But more about that in a minute. But Karen says. How is Pierre getting more than one to two hours sleep each day if he is juggling requests for interviews in a wide variety of time zones? You are a tireless hero. Yes. How does he keep up his energy, humor, spirits, given the continuing naysayers? Um, let's. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'll ask. Uh, Karen, when I'm on camera, I put my best forth, uh, my best self uh, forward. Um, the reality is I'm up and down all the time. It, 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 listen, everyone's struggling through COVID. I probably think in some ways I struggle less. I mean, when you look at out there, the misery, I've taken care of so many patients and I, I can't imagine the, the burdens and, and stuff that people walk through. But no, it, it's been a long, hard slog. I, I'm okay. I, I get sleep most nights, sort of. <laughs> we'll get there. I am just so happy. I got to tell you, I'm going to say the same thing. This is my motto, and I want everyone to hear this. Our mission and my belief is to make ivermectin the standard of care worldwide for the treatment of COVID-19. It will happen. The only thing I don't know, and I have no doubt it will happen. What I don't know is when it will happen. <laughs> if it doesn't happen in six weeks, Karen, I'm done. Stick a fork in with me. I don't know that I can do this for six more weeks, uh, but it, it, it'll happen. We'll get there. We certainly hope so, because it's about the 3,000 people dying in this country, you know, every day that that's what keeps us going. That's what we worry about here, folks. And that's all the time we have for now. Um, if we didn't get to your question, well, come back next week. We'll be here uh, next Wednesday night, next Wednesday afternoon, if you're in the West Coast. Um, we're going to be doing this again, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. In the meantime, 
we would love to have you as part of our FLCCC Alliance. Go to our website, that's https colon double slash forward slashes flccc.net. And there's a network and support page there and you can sign up and then we will get email updates to you so that you'll really know what's going on as soon as we know what's going on. We're happy to have you as part of our broader team because we are reaching around the world. Many people are signing up and we love you for it. As always, while you're doing that or while you're reading, we'll be doing this. We'll be doing more videos. We'll be following the news. Dr. Corey will be doing more interviews to, and webinars and talking to doctors around the world, and we'll be trying to influence those medical authorities that have the ability to change the rules and the regulations. Um, we are always just out there putting patients first, putting people first, even those that aren't yet patients, just putting people first. That's what we do. Meanwhile, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Take care. A lot.